Let me start you with the poll question here, Brian. You ready for this? Yeah, I am, Dan. Uh, Paulie, give Brian the poll question. If you had to give your list of the greatest players of NBA history of all time, who would be higher up toward the top of your list, Larry Bird or LeBron James? LeBron. Yeah, LeBron. Longevity. You can't, you can't argue. I mean, if you want to make this argument, LeBron's best three seasons, Larry Bird's best three seasons. Great argument. Longevity does count towards this. I mean, like, LeBron crushes Jordan's record, and he's, like, not slowing down anytime soon. Something has to be said for longevity. I agree. I'm right there with you. And if you do take the best three seasons from Bird and LeBron, then it's a push. But uh, I have to factor in that LeBron has played longer, played more minutes. Uh, it's going to be up yeah. there in assists and steals and points on the all-time list there. And Larry had a great run, but the bad back uh, cut that short. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let you me... know what's impressive about LeBron? And you know John Barry brought this to my attention yesterday. Like This guy has been the most hype player to ever come out of high school. And he has crushed, destroyed, and stomped out those expectations. And like, when does everyone live, anyone live up to the hype? And never do they actually destroy the expectation. So I'm going to give him a lot. I mean, like in today's day and age, squeaky clean image. You know, like obviously he's kind of like a polarizing figure. If people want to compare him to Jordan, which I think is like the utmost compliment. But man, like all the hype, all the surrounding the hundred million dollar contract before he even played a game, and he is like, like just like stomped out those expectations, destroyed those. But Brian, if we didn't have Jordan to compare him to, would LeBron be more liked, embraceable? Because he he's not. He's not beloved. I think he's respected, not beloved. Do you think it has to do with that Miami thing, though? I think the decision like stuck with it with the Bulls and you know, like the ups and downs, whatever like the, the scenario is. But him leaving to Miami, not one, not two, not three. I'm taking my talents to South Beach. Does, don't, doesn't all that kind of play into this? Yes. Yeah. The, the so decision. Like, forget the Jordan thing. I let's just take away. Let's say okay. Jordan was. You know, Jordan went three and three in the finals, and he has three championships. Like, let's just take that out of it. Uh, I, I do think that people would gravitate towards LeBron. I think he's the greatest ever still. I think the, the problem is chasing the rings, coming back to Cleveland. Like, that whole thing, I, like, it, it, I kind of threw people off. But I will say that him winning a championship um, sort of, like, I not, uh, verified him a little bit. And I'll tell you what, Dan, if he can somehow pull this one off, then – I think there's a conversation to be had. I don't think there's a conversation to be had right now, but I think there will be a legitimate conversation if he can somehow beat this Golden State Warrior team. I do, too. I, I, I'm right there with you, lockstep, and I know that people cringe when they hear that, that you want to compare the two or at least look at their resumes, but I, I think we're going to do that if that somehow happens. Let me ask you about the Celtics' future because they overachieved. It feels like they're a year or two ahead of schedule. I don't think the East is great, but if you're trying to game plan now of trying to win a championship, what do you do with this roster as you move forward having the number one overall pick, knowing Cleveland is still going to be good next year and probably the year after that? Yeah, so I think they're at the point now where the next move is like going to be as clear as day, Dan. It's not going to be like them trying to get a pick, them, you know, giving a late pick for Isaiah Thomas to see how it's going to work out. They're not, they're past that stage now. They're at the point now where every move that they make, it's going to be a monumental Hall of Fame type of player that they're going after, which is a good place to be in. You don't have to guess anymore. You don't have to guess, like, who the next guy is going to be. Like, if there's a chance to get an Anthony Davis, you go out there and you get Anthony Davis. That's just a, it's a no-brainer in that situation. I don't even think, to be honest with you, I think, like, the Paul George, Jimmy Butler conversations are almost going to die down now because this pick ends up being the number one pick and next year's draft, and you have young Jalen Brown. I think that next move is a monumental move, which for them, maybe you get it, maybe you don't. You know, Maybe you sign Gordon Hayward, maybe you don't, but they're going to obviously go for those things. But you, you can't bank on Gordon Hayward saying no to Utah and passing up on $40 million. But it doesn't mean you don't try to go ahead and do it. It doesn't mean you don't call New Orleans and say, can we make this trade to get you know, like this guy who can really take your team to another level. And you try, and if the team say no, then you continue to execute. But I don't think that they make any rash decisions, you know, try to make lateral moves. It's now is the time to make a move that is going to solidify you as a champion. If Isaiah Thomas was 6'3", putting up these numbers, would we be having this discussion that he's somehow expendable and they're a better team without him? If he was 6'3", Dan, we wouldn't have got him from Phoenix. 
Like the idea that he's a five nine and you can never win with a guy like this and all and he only makes, you know, six point two million dollars next year. If he was six three, we the conversation would be like, Man, we need an Isaiah Thomas on our team. <laughs> that would be the conversation. You wouldn't pick him up for like a twenty seventh pick in the draft. So like when the Celtics are rebuilding, Phoenix is not all of a sudden just gonna give up an Isaiah Thomas. You take the risk on a guy because he is five nine and that's how the Celtics got him. The rest of the world didn't see the game changing the way that maybe Danny did or Danny just happened to like him and, and in the league happened to go small at the exact same time and the explosion of, you know, the spread four and the high pick and roll and Isaiah Thomas all comes to fruition now, but it, like 6-3, this conversation isn't. We're, we're having a conversation like uh, how, how much better is he than Russell Westbrook or James Harden if he's 6 foot three? Any chance the Celtics take Lonzo Ball? I don't uh, Here's the chance. If Markel Fultz comes in, and the medical is not good on him. Danny in the past, I've known Danny for a long time now. If the medical is not good on a guy, he 100% trusts his doctors in the evaluation process. If the medical is not good on him, they'll pass on him. I'm, I don't know why you know, the medical would not be good on him. He missed a few games here. He never had any major crazy injuries or you know, the meniscus taken out or an ACL or nothing like that. So why the medical would be bad on him, I don't know, but they are going to evaluate him. And then it could be, it becomes like an issue. If the doctors say no, then it's like, man, we, don't even, we didn't even bring in Lonzo Ball in, in this scenario. What do we do? And it's like you have to vet and find out as much as you can about him. So that's the scenario. I doubt it's going to happen, but that's it. We're talking to Brian Scalabrini, who works for Comcast Sportsnet New England. The Cavaliers will win the title if? If Clay Thompson continues to play the way he's been playing. I mean, he has to break out of the slump. Did you go and check this out? Obviously, we know the Warriors have steamrolled the Western Conference, right? We, we all can identify that. Klay Thompson's net rating during the playoffs, minus 11. That's, that's like, like, it's almost like bothersome to understand. Like, how, with all these great players out there, how have you and your team been this bad? Like, you're such a good player. You are a clutch shooter. I, there's, I've, I, I've coached Klay. I, I, I've never thought in a million years he would even go into a slump, and he is – been in the slump this whole playoff so I think that he needs to play average to you know like not above average not great not game six of OKC last year he needs to play that way and then if uh, Kevin Love continues to play at this level that's how the Cavs win so a, a bad Thompson and a phenomenal Love would be Cavs win but I just I don't know I just don't see that happening this storyline emerged here after uh, Kyrie had his big night that uh, Kyrie, Steph Curry, who would you take? And I'm, I'm thinking, wh- where did the, how did this happen that all of a sudden Kyrie has this big, big game? I, I love him. He hit, I think he's talented. His handle's as good as Curry's, maybe better, but he, he's not Steph Curry to me. I, I mean, you were, you coached Steph Curry. Yeah. Uh, maybe you're yeah. biased, but who would you take? Is this an argument, Kyrie Irving, Steph Curry? Um, it's, I guess, let's like, if you want dice, it, let's go with the 30,000 foot view. I would say, no, it's, it's a Steph Curry conversation, but start dissecting the game. Like for isolation, Kyrie's better in isolation and pick and roll. Steph Curry's better off the ball. Like, you know, catch and shoot situations. Steph Curry's better defensively. Kyrie is better. So, and that's, then that's defensively when he's engaged, not like the last month of the season, which was an absolute embarrassment to watch the Cavs play defense during that time. I love when people say they can't flip the switch. I'm like, well, they surely flipped the switch off on defense, so why can't they flip it back on to defend? So, you know, there's some, there's some comparison. It's just when you see a guy, and we always overreact to this. This is why we put Kobe Bryant so great. It's like when you see a guy who isolates a guy one-on-one and makes tough shots and does amazing things, not, you know, the Spurs moving the ball around and getting wide open shots and that equaling them winning. When this guys go one on one against guys like Avery Bradley, Terry Rozier, Marcus Smart, they do that and they destroy them. Like that, it's like it's overinflated. Those two points are overinflated. It, it is still two points, and I think he's one of the best isolation players in the league. There is no weakness to his game, but the off the ball shooting of Steph Curry in today's day and age with the team that they have and Draymond running point guard. It's, it's a real problem. It's going to be a good matchup, though. I think Steph Curry outplays him this final. I don't think it's going to be like we saw last year. Brian, always good to talk to you. Thank you. All right, Dan. That's Brian Scalabrini, the White Mamba. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.